welcome to Working for Yourself from Passion to Profit, which is a series of five workshops and more to follow after that. Okay, Emily, next, please. So today is all about defining you, branding and marketing yourself. And I often say, whether you're a freelancer, a consultant, uh, whether you're selling your own products or services, no matter what you do in life, even if you're trying to get an internship or job, there's nothing more important than branding yourself. And this is something that is critical for everyone. Get to hear from five experts who have done a superb job of branding and marketing themselves and others over the next 90 minutes. So with that, if we could go to the next slide, please. So just so you know, the three remaining workshops we're actually doing next Monday, and it's about getting out and building your client base. And often this is one of the most difficult things that people who are out on their own doing. Everyone's so afraid of quote selling and so afraid of rejection but it is also absolutely critical because unless you are constantly building your client base, you will not be able to have a thriving business and sustain yourself. So we'll be doing that on Monday so we don't compete with Valentine's Day. <laughs> and then the Tuesday after that, we'll do understanding legal jargon. How do you know what type of organization to form, a sole proprietorship, a partnership, a corporation? How do you create proposals that are good, solid contracts that protect you? And then what's the story with IP? What is considered legally protectable IP, intellectual property? whether it be logos, taglines, proprietary content, how, uh, consulting techniques, how do you go and protect that? And last, we're gonna do operating smoothly, managing your time and money. And I will tell you, as we have had successful people who work for themselves, built their own businesses, the one thing they all say that they wish the university had done a better job of is teaching them how to manage money, how to survive with often inconsistent income, how to manage expenses, how to manage multiple credit card bills and bank accounts and taxes. So those are all critical topics that we'll be covering starting next week. And again, you could scan this QR code, learn more about them and register. Okay, great. Next, please, Emily. So our speakers today, and they will introduce themselves shortly, is Lucas Ballacy. Lucas, did I pronounce your name right? You got it right. <laughs> and he's partner and chief experience officer of Barrel, which is an agency that specializes in e-commerce, et cetera. So he'll have a lot to add for those of you trying to sell your own goods and services on the web. Next, we have Meg DeBrito. Meg, did I get your last name right? I muted, but you did, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, she's a graduate of Tyler 06, and she's director of brand and narrative, and she'll tell you about Impact P and PHL, a great organization in the city of Philly. Next is Jen Dennis, who's a 2000 Tyler grad, former adjunct professor or full time, she'll tell you in a minute. And she's now senior creative director of Green Thumb Industries, which is a really cool company. 
And last but not least is Young Park, who is founder of Cocktail Culture and another new business she'll tell you about. And I will be moderating the panel and quiet so you can get all of their wisdom. Okay, do we have anything else? Okay, so with this point, we could put off the screen sharing or do we don't have BY be your own boss for next, do we? And Those slides are at the end, Alan. Okay, all right. Oh, right. I have to call we out can everyone. Show who them is now if you want, but <laughs> no, no. Everyone who's co sponsoring us. So, our partners throughout the university are the Career Center, Tyler, uh, the College of Engineering, College of Liberal Arts, uh, Fox Business School. Fine School Communication and our extremely valuable Small Business Development Center. So thank you to all the partners and we will now dig right in. And just in terms of process for the uh, participants, we will be talking as a panel until about 10 to five, uh, sorry, 10 to six, five to six. And then we're gonna split up um, all of you who are participating into different breakout rooms and we will put a mentor a panelist in each room so you can ask questions in a more informal personalized way okay so with that i guess and i'll go through all the panelists if you could just spend 90 seconds introducing yourself and discussing what you're currently doing and let's start with Meg. Sure. Um, hi, my name is Meg DeBrito. I am the director of brand and narrative for Impact PHL. Impact PHL is a fairly new organization. It's about five years old. Um, and we work on getting high net investors, angel investors, and the one percenters in our community to take their money out of the global market and move it into a local market. This is a new movement that's happening. Um, and so I've joined the team fairly recently um, from a lot of work over time um, to help build the feeling and the story that goes behind this brand and bring it together with um, what they quickly put together in terms of visual content previously. So I'm in a rebuilding process in my role. Great. All right, thank you. Lucas? Yep, my name is Lucas, uh, partner and chief experience officer at Farrell. Uh, Farrell, whoop, is that some feedback? Um, Farrell partners with clients to really help them um, optimize and improve their e-commerce experiences, um, and then also build out and redesign new ones. Um, I've been with the company for about 10 years, um, so been a big part of the journey for me, both in my professional career and the journey of the agency. Um, and excited to be here and chat with all of you. Great. Jen? Hi, everybody. I'm Jen Dennis. I'm the Senior Creative Director at Green Thumb Industries. We are a um, multi-state operator of a cannabis company, and I'm based in Los Angeles currently, but our headquarters are in Chicago. Um, my role here is to oversee two independent creative teams. They're independent from each other, but all within the company. Um, one, in, one of the teams operates in service of our retail marketing efforts and the other in service of our brand marketing efforts. And prior to this, I was the head of branding for Honey Grow. Um, for those of you in the Philadelphia area and especially Temple, you know Honey Grow on campus. Um, I set up all their initial branding, um, was with them for about six years while they grew from two to over 30 locations. And prior to that was in advertising and in between the two was um, freelancing and consulting um, and have done consistent freelancing throughout my entire career. Great. And Jen, Green Thumbs was a basic startup when you joined them a couple of years ago, right? They were a little bit more than a startup, um, but they've been becoming less of a startup month over month, week mm -hmm. over week. Okay, great. And Zhang with picture included. As soon as you say that, my uh, my phone gave me 20% battery. So I'm living here as long as I can, and then I'm switching over to just audio when my phone dies. Um, so... Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jung. It's like jungle without the L-E. Um, I founded uh, Cocktail Culture Co. Uh, we are a booking platform 
for uh, cocktail classes and uh, whiskey tastings, basically interactive events in alcohol. Uh, we are from the Be Your Own Boss Bowl in 2016, um, third place undergraduate track there. Um, after I founded Cocktail Culture Co, I uh, came across an idea for live band karaoke and figured it was the same thing where it's all interactive entertainment, one's just in alcohol, one's just in music. So um, that brand is still building um, and relaunching uh, a little bit later since post COVID. A um, couple of things that happened to us in 2022 that was pretty cool, Cocktail Culture Co. We um, won uh, t- uh, Best of Philly for Philadelphia Style Magazine. Uh, Five Minutes of Fame, we made our debut at the Kimmel Center a few months ago. Um, I have been freelancing uh, marketing services um, and, you know, slowly just transition that transition that over to an agency. Okay, great. So, Jean, let's continue with you. Can you describe your journey, sort of what you studied in college, what you thought you would do when you were graduating and what led you to your current career? Yes, I was very lost. <laughs> I, I bet there's a lot of students that probably feel that way. And I feel like that's normal and part of the process. You know, when you like, there's people that start school and you're undecided, you know, you're one major, then you're another, you know, you feel like um, you're kind of everywhere. And that, and that was me too. Uh, I did end up graduating uh, as a marketing major. Um, but I f- always felt weird because I never spent a lot of time with the marketing guys. I always spent more time with the entrepreneurship program. So I was like, who am I? Where do I belong? Um, Once I started Cocktail Culture Co., it took me about three years um, to uh, really uh, generate enough revenue where I can, uh, I wasn't working for free or nothing anymore. (laughs) So that took a few years. Um, And that that was pretty much my journey. You know, originally I was a finance major, then I was a frisk, then I was marketing, and then spent all my time with the entrepreneurship program, and here I am. (laughs) Okay, great. How about you, Jen? Um, I kind of knew what I wanted to do when I went into college. Um, I studied, so technically I didn't go to Temple, so I hope that's okay, but I did, was an adjunct. Um, and, I, and I taught graphic design to seniors um, a few years ago, but I went to University of Delaware and I went to the visual, through the visual communications program, which got me a BFA, a Bachelor of Fine Arts. Um, I was really into graphic design and didn't think I'd be in advertising, but I took all the same classes and I wanted to make sure I knew both. Um, and then kind of ended up more in a very design driven advertising track for myself. Um, I cut my teeth, you know, with advertising agencies, multiple in the Philadelphia area. Um, I landed at one um, called Quaker City Mercantile, which is still there today. Um, Was there for almost 11 years, I think. And that was enough time at an agency, went off on my own. I felt like this was, I have a lot of experience in the agency world and working with clients and people and building relationships. It was like, I was like, if I'm ever going to do this by myself, now's the time. Did that, loved it got certified to teach yoga, was teaching yoga on the side while also working on my own schedule. Um, one of my freelance clients was the founder of Honey Grow. And I, he hit me up. I got referred to him through a connection from another project. And they like we did about six months of project work together. And then he said that he wanted me to join full time. And I was like, I don't know if I'm ready to get work married again. Um, I kind of enjoyed this like freewheeling lifestyle. So we did a little like try before you buy and we did about six months of like seeing if this is going to work out and it did. It gave me time to offload some of my freelance clients, but I kind of kept some irons in the fire still Um, and, you know, stayed with them for about six years and then, you know, wanted a change of pace. So I moved um, to the other side of the country, (laughs) but I had grown up in the East Coast and spent almost 20 years in Philadelphia. So I feel like I had given Philly like everything and I was ready for a new challenge. Um, but, you know, I think I knew that I wanted to do something design related and I wanted to make an impact in terms of like the kinds of brands and products I worked on um, and provide like an artistic and a aesthetically pleasing way of moving through the world and all of the different products one interacts with. Um, so I'll, I could go on and on, but I'll let, I, I want to get to our other folks because I want to hear about your journeys too. Thank you. Great. So Lucas, you're up. Yeah. Um, so I... You know, going back before college, I fell in design through music. I was a musician promoting my music and creating artwork and posters and um, didn't really know that was a career path. So 
decided to pre pursue that. Um, funny enough, my neighbor went to Tyler. And so I saw what she was doing. She's working at a toy company at the time and only applied to Tyler. Um, and then luckily got into Tyler. Uh, I don't know what would have happened otherwise, <laughs> um, but um, was pretty sure I wanted to do design, but enjoyed going through the foundations program. Actually came in with uh, a teaching certification um, plan. So I was going to get the design, uh, get my major in design, but then also um, get teaching certification. And I, I was pretty sure I was going to become an art teacher, um, but quickly kind of changed paths and decided to focus on design. Um, through my time at Tyler, I founded the TA program within the design department at Tyler. So graphic and interactive design. Um, Greater Temple had a TA program and I brought it to the design um, major um, and found a lot of enjoyment out of actually teaching and, and learning how to write a curriculum and all that sort of stuff. Um, when I got out of school, I moved into an interior design company in New York. Um, I had done some interning in LA, Jen, I thought I was gonna move out there, um, but I've just enjoyed visiting for now. Um, moved to New York and really didn't love that job. I was doing, um, some graphic design work, but it was just not really, um, you know, I wasn't working with the team. I was kind of on my own. Uh, so I started to look elsewhere and started creating um, kind of the portfolio of digital work that I wanted to be doing um, on the side. Um, and, you know, realized that, you know, I think getting out of college for me, I wanted security. I wanted to have, you know, the right salary benefits and all this sort of stuff. And, um, decided to kind of throw that all the way and, and take a freelance role at the company I work at now, um, funny enough. So I started there as a freelance designer. Uh, I had like a three month contract, um, went full time, or I found out I was going full time about a month and a half in um, and have just been there, like I mentioned earlier, for 10 years, um, just helping grow the business, grow the structure of the team. Um, and I think for me, I brought up the TA piece from college because I found a really strong passion in just like overall leadership management, working with people. Um, and so most of what I do these days is coordinating process between teams, talking to clients, um, and just really helping manage the agency. Um, and so I oversee all of our discipline teams and I work closely with the CEO. Um, so I do a lot of design stuff on the side just for, you know, the agency or for myself, um, but really focus in that world at this point. Okay, great. <clears throat> And Meg? Yeah, so I'll jump in and say, um, prior to going to college, I came from a family um, with a lot of artists, uh, graphic artists within it. And my grandfather actually taught as an art teacher. So I was going into college thinking I wanted to do art, right? I started in sculpture. I then moved to architecture and have a degree in architecture. But throughout my college time, I was taking graphic classes, I was taking art space classes and working on that part of my skill set. Um, when I left college, I actually worked for architecture firms for the first year, two years, but part of my interest in art, part of my interest in creation was positive change, progressive change in the world. And how do I do that as an architect? I couldn't quite figure that out in that moment in the right way. It was just like a ideology and less of an, uh, something that we could do in that career cycle. And so I moved on to working. I got a graphic design position um, and then started leading campaigns with the Fund for the Public Interest, which was a national public interest uh, policy org. And I stepped away from that to do freelance work um, with small organizations in Philadelphia, as well as across the state and nationally, including Impact Peach, I'm sorry, Impact Peach, that's who I'm working for now, uh, Equality PA, uh, Media Mobilizing Project, um, Environment California, Environment Justice. So I was working on a lot of um, large graphic and media-based campaigns um, and the creative strategy there. And as I was doing that work, um, I had been in Philadelphia for a really long time, having gone to Tyler and Temple and uh, had the people, the board from Greensboro, which some of you may know, it's an organization in Philadelphia that's a 23-year-old urban farm, right? They reached out to me and they wanted both my sort of 
creative management skills and my strategy based skills to help them rebuild that organization. So I actually stepped in with all of this creative skill to look at how do I use the creative skill to build a nonprofit that functions 80% as a business. And it was because I was a freelancer for long enough that I could actually like take that into a, a process of rebuilding a nonprofit and organization. Uh, I moved from there into actually doing using creative skills around fundraising and was working for Pasa Sustainable Agriculture for a year and a half, raised over $100 million with creative strategy for how to get people to put their money behind the land, behind the food that we need. And then I stepped into the role that I'm in now um, to do a little bit of the same thing. How do we use creativity image and visual presentation to help people move their thought process forward. So that's what I keep kind of doing is using the design process to move ideas. Okay, great. All right, so I'm going to ask a question of one or two of you, and then if anyone else has anything to add, just go ahead and do it. So I'll start with Jen. For someone who's starting out on their own or their own business, how do you define marketing for them and why is it important? Well, for me, I think that marketing is everything about how you carry and present yourself. Um, it's everything from your social media interactions to um, a flyer for self-promotion that you create, or if you put up um, a TikTok video or a reel that's showcasing what you've done recently, every way that you present yourself to the public is a way of marketing. Um, when I look for freelancers or if a freelancer hits me up to be, you know, cause I have a job posting and maybe I'm looking for a full-time role but I'll take a freelancer in the interim. I don't just look at their resume or their portfolio site. I obviously look at those things. I looked at their LinkedIn profile. I also stalk them on social media because I want to know a little bit about who they are as a human and who I'm going to be interacting with. Um, and I think that's part, I think that speaks to like as a freelancer, you are your own personal brand. And if you don't, if you're not easy to work with, if you're difficult, if you're unreliable, if you, you know, if you present yourself in an irresponsible way, then that's going to reflect on your, the potential work you might be getting or not getting. Um, it's amazing. You know, the internet is such a beautiful and scary and wonderful thing all at once. Um, it can both be our biggest enemy or our greatest tool. Um, and I think it, it matters how you put yourself out there. Um, look at any politician or celebrity. If you think that there's skeletons that you can hide in your closet, they'll, they'll come out one way or the other. Um, so marketing to me is kind of everything and networking and relationships with people, um, I think are tremendously important. Um, I think some, I think Meg, you were talking about some relationships that you've built over time. Like you never know where those connections are going to lead to. You interact with someone one day, they shift gears in their life, but they remembered a positive interaction with you. They'll hit you up for something down the road. So the, the old adage of, you know, not burning bridges, like could never be more true. Um, I have a, one of my good contacts, good close friends. He and I worked together at, in the agency world a long time ago. He is like the mind of like a steel trap. He remembers everybody's names. He knows exactly what they worked on together, where they lived. And, and like, he's not my agent, but he, I would consider him an unofficial one because I'm always asking him like, who is that person that we worked with on this thing? Oh Yeah. Do you know where they are now? Like he knows everything about everybody and he's had a really successful independent career because of that relationship building and that retention. Um, I take a lot of notes <laughs> and try to use those to like jog my memory because I don't have that kind of brain. Um, but I think relationships and understanding that every way you present yourself out there is a form of marketing is my approach. Okay, great. So, so Lucas, you deal with a lot of people on Shopify, selling their goods on e-commerce. What do you, how do those people market or how should they be marketing in your mind? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of what Jen just said, you can apply, you know, take from for one single person and apply it to an entire brand. I think when we think about brands, we'd like to actually think about them as people um, and how would they talk, how would they interact, who are the people they're hanging out with. It just helps you kind of understand, you know, what what types of content should we be thinking about? Um, how should we connect with our customer? And rather than thinking about a giant group of people connecting with a customer, it's how does that one person? Um, so I think similarly, you know, 
a lot of, um, and it goes as a freelancer, it goes as a brand, um, you know, our company is really, you know, not leaning into so much what you're selling and trying to get people to buy it, but really thinking about the ecosystem that really surrounds um, that product or that, that service. Um, and so when we think about marketing, it's really like, you know, we have a, um, if we have a client that is selling uh, skateboarding shoes, right? It's not just talking about the shoes all the time, but talking about, you know, the world of skateboarding and, you know, tips for skateboarding and people who have, you know, these amazing uh, stories and, and what they've done with their career um, and ways to really interact with the brand with customers on a different level. Um, and if they keep coming back and interacting with you, you know, hopefully they start to buy your products or services because they look to you as a thought leader. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, you know, whether you're a freelancer or a brand, um, we think about marketing as like, you know, focusing on what you do, how you think and what you like, the things that you're interested in. Um, you know, even as a brand, you know, there are a lot of uh, co-branding opportunities um, and, you know, different ways to interact with other brands, much like people interact with other people. So how do you bring all those worlds together on the channels that Jen was talking about um, is really key. Okay, great. Meg or Zhang, anything you want to add to this? Yeah, I'd love to jump in and say, I think two of the pieces that I heard in both of these, but I'll just uh, restate them. One is how do you frame yourself, right? What is your behavior? How do you want to frame that behavior? And then also who is your audience and what audience are you sort of pushing that frame to? So thinking about yourself in those two areas, both audience and behavior will help you build that brand in just the same way that you might build that on the outside. And I love the audience piece, I think can be so overwhelming. Um, and especially as a, as a, I haven't spent a lot of time freelancing, so I can't speak to that, but I do a lot of writing on the side um, about what I do. And I think don't let that be a non-starter. I think just sharing and putting stuff out there is oftentimes how you find the people that are interested um, because you can spend a lot of time trying to refine like who this perfect target is and just, but until you start interacting and sharing things, you don't really know. Um, and so I would say that, you know, just to add on, Meg, hopefully you agree with me on that, but um, just to add on, I think that can become like something that gets you caught up um, and doesn't need to be. <clears throat> right, but it's like, as you're saying, it's an interactive yes. crawl, walk, run, yes. right? Like first yep. you're crawling, you're putting things out there, seeing how people react and then starting to build off of them. Exactly. And that sometimes feels scary when it's a freelance thing and it feels like it's about you, right? right. But if you right. think you know your frame, you can think of that as your what you're handing out. So yeah, totally. good point about the audience. Okay, great. So Zhang, if I can... So, you know, Meg describes it as a frame. One of the ways that, you know, I'm used to defining it is as a brand, right? And I won't ask because each of you are your own brands. So, Jean, talk a little bit about what you are as a brand and why it's so important for everyone in the audience to think about developing themselves as a brand. Totally, cause like I never thought about this in the beginning. Um, cause in the beginning, in the beginning stages, like you're probably stuck at like, what do I even want to offer? <laughs> you know, what are my products? What are my services? And what, how do I want to price it? But beyond that, your brand um, really stands for you or, or, or your company. Um, you know, there's think about your brand voice and tone, your attitude, your beliefs, you know? So if I were to kind of break down um, I see one of my students, uh, Honoka, in this in this room right now. And Honoka, Honoka, she's in my class. And, you know, my teaching approach is totally untraditional. You know, uh, my personal branding is um, it's like it's like David Goggins meets Joan Jett and a mild version of Nicki Minaj. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, you know, there's that bad girl energy, independent, motivated, ruthless. And then you look at like Cocktail Culture Co. They that has its own brand voice and tone. But we all share this. Um, cocktail culture, five minutes of fame, jungle in a million. We all share a really fun energy. Um, but cocktail culture, it's more like sophisticated troublemakers because it is a, it is a luxury service um, versus five minutes of fame. I mean, like, you know, the entire activity 
is about you getting on stage with a live band that you've never rehearsed with. You might even not know how to sing. Maybe you took a few shots of tequila. It's very ruthless, high energy, and unapologetic about being yourself. Um, so you think of your brand as way past your product and service. Like, what do you stand for? Like, what's your voice and tone? What's your attitude and what's your beliefs? Okay, great. Uh, Jane, you want to step up on that? I don't have a lot to add. I think Jung had brought a lot to that one. I'm, I don't know how much more I can build on this one, but everything everyone else said was super helpful. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. So there's sort of, we've posited three or four critical questions. And, you know, some of the students have heard or seen the value proposition, right? You know, for what target audience, you or whoever's in the audience offers what product and services that have what benefits for their target? And why should you be chosen versus what's probably the thousands of competitors out? So let's take this one at a time. How should people out there who are either thinking of starting their own enterprise, whether it be consulting, you know, graphics, video, whatever, manufacturing their own clothes, how should they define who they are? What questions should they be asking themselves? Because in my work with entrepreneurs, it is one of the toughest questions for people to answer. So who wants to go first in terms of what questions our audience should ask themselves to help define them? I'll jump in first. <laughs> um, I think the primary thing to ask is what makes me unique, right? Who am I? What are the intersections that I hold uh, in either, you know, my person or my skill set or my relationships? Um, I think the other piece is really like, what are my values and my sight line? Like, what did I discover? What is the values that I hold that then pulls through the skill sets that I have? So I think those are the big questions to ask yourself that help you define yourself as a brand. Okay, so Meg, you talked about what are your skill sets, right? Mm -hmm. And sort of what makes you distinctive, which is another very difficult thing. So how do you define, let's say you've all been involved in the business world, the creative world. Let's say you want to go out and consult Meg for a new business or a new nonprofit. What are you offering? I'm offering 15 years of working with nonprofits. I'm offering growing up on the street, basically, and working with the, you know, top um, of the field, right? So I understand everybody's perspectives from different sides of, um, and I'm offering 21 years of relationships in Philadelphia. And um, yeah, I'm not giving a great pitch right now. <laughs> No, no, that, okay. So is, is that what this is? Up, I, I don't know. In my environment of like packaged goods. So those are the features. Right. What are the benefits? So you have amazing experience, amazing connections from the street to the top of the top. Right. What are the benefits of me hiring you? Right. What are the benefits of you hiring me? Um, the benefits of you hiring me are that I already I bring tools and resources and understanding a visual understanding that I've developed over many years right um I feel like you're asking me a different question that I'm not hitting though no no <laughs> so I want to pass it <laughs> it's good it's good um but I, yeah I mean I think the the benefits that I bring to the table when I pick up a new client is that I've worked with a lot of different clients, right? And I can see and unpack and evaluate from multiple different audience perspectives, right? So. Okay, great. 
And by the way, raising a hundred million bucks ain't that common, right? <laughs> <laughs> we could all use some of that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So Lucas, when you're same sort of questions when you're talking to a potential client who wants to get on Spotify or whatever, you know, start selling through e-commerce. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, so this has changed a lot um, over the years. I think what we've found is really focusing and keeping narrow at what we're good at is important and getting really good at that thing. Um, you know, I've build out other teams that don't exist anymore. Like we had a content studio, we've done all these sort of things. And I think what you learn is as you start to get some traction, clients want more things and it's easier to do it with you. Um, and so rather than trying to do it all and then doing it poorly or just not enough, finding people in your network who can provide those services is just as good as doing them yourselves and making those connections to other, you know, other folks. Um, but then really focusing your intention and where, uh, where you can succeed and keep getting better. Um, and so we've gone through like all sorts of positioning over the years and have really started to narrow focus in on, um, you know, creating these commerce experiences for clients of, of different sizes and even, you know, finding nuances in the language there of instead of saying e-commerce, talking about commerce, because we have clients who e-commerce isn't their strongest channel. Um, and so you know, sometimes they'd be like, oh, direct to consumer e-commerce, like we shouldn't work with you. And we're like, no, you can work with us. We understand, you know, the, the, the bigger picture. Um, I think it's tough in the agency in, in our line of work to differentiate, you know, a lot of people are working on the same platforms. A lot of teams have great design. A lot of teams know how to use the technology. Um, and so for us, it really comes down to providing great service um, you know, connecting with really understanding our clients and our clients' customers. Um, you know, we try to turn that first call with um, clients into an opportunity to get to know them and their brand and not jump to the work. And I think if I were to be starting out as a freelancer or doing anything else, that same mentality of like, we're not trying to sell things from day one um, is really, really helpful framing because it just changes the dynamic so much. Um, and so I think for us, you know, those initial calls, a lot of the feedback that we get um, from clients is just how much time we took um, to really understand them and get the proper context before we jump to putting proposals in front of them or talking about, you know, how much it's gonna cost or trying to send an SOW over a scope of work. Um, and so I think for us, differentiation comes from those interactions and. Um, kind of relationships and, and sharing that we do, um, you know, within our network. <clears throat> yeah, and, and Lucas, you touched on two points that I think are very interesting and easy to cross over. Number one is specializing, right? I mean, so many of us want to offer as many services as we can to as many people as we can. And at the end of the day, we end up not being meaningful enough to anyone. Mm -hmm. And then the other you talked about, because you know, in freelancing and consulting and you know, doing paintings or graphic design, there's probably a thousand people just doing it in Philadelphia, right? <laughs> yeah. And one of the points that you spoke about is customer service and understanding the customer as a differentiator. And so, I don't know, you go to Jan or Jung for a minute. Any circumstances you've seen in your careers where really understanding the consumer, sort of customizing your offerings have really helped you? I can go. Um, I think that like, like everything that everyone said so far about specializing is super important. Um, not to keep going back to relationships, but like, you know, if you are going to specialize, which I think is great advice, it's helpful to have like supporting people or, or groups that might do those things that are adjacent to what you're specializing in so that you can be a connector for your client as well. Like, I think it's great to say you can't do everything, but you're really good at this one aspect of it. And if you, if you client need this additional resource or this additional facet, then I have this 
group, this company, this person, this team that will assist in that specialty. Um, and I think that has proven really successful. Um, the other aspect I think is to, you know, it's that like personability, like if you might not be the best graphic designer out there, but you're the easiest to work with. And that doesn't mean like squandering, like your, your, your ideals or your design approach, but like you are, you know, you are collaborative, you are conversational, you are responsive, um, you you deliver things when you say you're going to deliver them, um, you can be the most, You there's another quote someone said about like, you might not be able to be the smartest person in the room, but you can be the hardest working. Um, so you don't have to be the expert of all experts in your field, but there are other aspects to this line of work, this way of working, being freelancing that will give you a leg up on others. Great. Sean, you want to say something? Yeah, I think when it comes to, I mean, I agree with everything that Jen said. Um, so with this is just kind of like an add on. Um, specializing in something. Well, I feel like when you're building something, you know, like you're kind of crazy if you think, if you expect everything to grow really fast, that's like a lot of work, guys. Okay. And <laughs> if anybody knows me, I do not, yup, like I do not stress about perfection at all. Like I just focus on um, process and progress. Um, but I think it is really important to focus on one. Like when I first started for cocktail culture, um, I, not that I specialized, but I definitely honed in on like bachelor parties and corporate events over um birthday parties bachelor parties etc um and you know date nights and anniversaries but that's also because i um try to identify what's my tw my 2080 rule for the business like where do i think who do i think these 20 percent people are that are going to give me 80 percent of my money and i realize that's large parties um you know this also applies like in some of my marketing projects right now like even though i cover like i call it like all the uh small business essentials like social media, email, search engine, a website. My process is much tighter with social media. Um, so right now I'm focusing on social media first because um, it just, I feel the most comfortable and confident with our process. I um, mean, I think it's easier to grow in that category. So definitely specializing or focusing on like one or two is a good idea in my opinion. Okay, great. So I'm gonna sort of try a rapid fire thing so I could get everyone into their groups. And we'll start with Meg. What are, for someone out on their own, what are the two most important marketing activities they should do? Somebody out on their own, what are the two most important marketing activities? Yeah. I'd say the having a really clean, uh, well navigable website and having a social media presence that is what we were talking about earlier the frame of your personal brand um whether that be under the business or under yourself making that decision i think those are the two most important okay great lucas yeah i would say i'm going to add on to what meg just said i think um outreach to new and warm uh, relationships. So um, we reach out to two, all the, the four partners reach out to two um, people every week for the last many years. It's turned into so much new work um, by just doing that and staying disciplined doing that. Um, you know, so it's, it's a huge amount of people and it just keeps those relationships going. So doing that. Um, and then I think on the social media piece, like just sharing, just constantly sharing what you're doing, even if you don't think it's interesting. That is like so key because it's probably interesting to someone else. Um, so don't worry so much about what to say. Just talk about what you're interested in, what you do, and just keep putting that out there um, as painful as it might feel sometimes. <laughs> okay, great. Jen? Um, have your elevator pitch ready, like, you know, 60 seconds, 90 seconds, the faster you can explain to somebody what it is that you do and why it's better than any other option. Um, Oh, I had another one. Oh, um, a case study or two or however many you have, like that showcases, like I just gave you my sales pitch, but you don't have to believe me. Here's an example of something that I've done. Maybe there's a testimonial from a really happy client. Like those kinds of referrals and recommendations, I think go a long way. Great. Well, this rapid fire, good. Such rich insight. Jung, two more. 
All right. So uh, Meg said website, totally. I was going to say describing your service, but you know, that happens usually on your website. Um, unless you have like a massive Instagram and TikTok audience, um, from my experience, uh, when you have an audience and if it's and like a real audience, not robots, um, if it's 25,000 and up, um, that's like, those are the accounts I see, like you post something and you sell it, um, describing your value online too. Um, so like Jen said, you know, credibility comes under, okay, case study, testimonials, reviews, um, and then like later on paid ads. Okay, great. All right. Last topic I want to cover before we go to breakout rooms. Pricing is always a very, very tough issue when people are starting out. And inevitably, the feedback that we always get is most people, when they start out on their own, whether they be offering their expertise, creative work, whatever, underprice themselves. What's your advice for how people should figure out how to price either their expertise or work they're producing? And I'll open that up to whoever wants to start the discussion. I can I would, that. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, please okay, share. Go. <laughs> I'll Who's go on quickly. Um, Come on, I, I would say that um, this just, this is a, a challenge for, I haven't met anyone, I don't care how far along they are in their career, their agency or whatever, that doesn't struggle with this. The reason being, the market's always changing. There's always, you know, different demands, the technology is evolving. So it's always something that I think, um, you know, folks are thinking about. And so just normalizing that, I think is important as you're trying to figure this out. Um, because I don't think anyone has, you know, figured it out. It's always kind of evolving. Um, at the same time, I think, you know, taking time to learn from your peers and see what other folks are are charging and, you know, what success they've had, um, if they're open to sharing it, you know, share first to try to get that kind of feedback. Um, but the thing I was going to say is really understanding the end customer and what value, you know, you're going to bring to them. And, you know, for us in, in the business world, if we're trying to charge $350,000 for a website, for a client that is doing a million dollars in sales, you really have to understand like what kind of investment you're asking them to make. Um, and, you know, sometimes we're like, hey, like for what you're asking and what it would take for us to actually do this, we're just not a good fit. And like, let's just, you know, set them up with someone else who we think is and having that network of referrals. Um, but I think, you know, understanding what, um, what someone would be willing to pay how much value it's going to bring to them is really important. Um, there's a few good books, Pricing Creativity and Women Without Pitching are, are really good books that talk about this in depth. Um, so I'll stop there, but I think it is a complex topic. And it's a continued um, you know, challenge that I see as a dialogue with a lot of folks. Okay, I'll put the title. You know what, Lucas, can you put the titles of those books in the I'm chat? on it right now. Yep, and I'm on it. Who else would like to share? <clears throat> Um, I can go. So I think there's multiple, when you first start pricing, there's multiple ways to approach pricing. And some of the things I would take into consideration is that, you know, one, okay, like what are other people charging, right? You could take that into consideration or, you know, the other thing is, well, do you want to charge high or low? Maybe pick that. Okay. Um, you know, do you want to be like price focused and be cheap? Um, or do you want to offer more value, be luxury or premium? I don't like being in the middle but that's just me. Like, I think every entrepreneur or every person that's ever charged money for anything will have a different approach to it. Um, and if you're not sure about what your price is or like how to handle the structure yet, I love having a minimum. So it's like, okay, yeah. think about the scenarios you don't want to deal with. Um, so, Hey, like, for example, this, this service starts at $300 because anyone that doesn't have $300, I don't want to talk to them. Um, my pricing history for cocktail culture um, has developed uh, but like every other thing as aspect of the business. The classes used to be $40 to $60 a person. And now we are $125 a person to $200 a person. Uh, most of our sales uh, end up in the $125 to $160 a person range. You know, the band, we used to be a $300. Lucas, you play music. You know, it's hard. <laughs> Very hard. <laughs> you know, we've, we've been a $300 cash band on a Tuesday, right? And then, 
going to $3,000 for two hours um, to that $7,800 mark for weddings. Um, but pricing, like everything else, is a development process that it's not the end of the world if you don't get it figured out ASAP. Like, worst thing you're going to do is you're going to come up with the price and then realize you're wrong <laughs> and then you fix it. But you're only going to that because you're trying. There's a theme here of just getting started, which I love. Yeah. <laughs> I want to jump in on that and just think about like as a freelancer, there's also a couple of different ways that you can approach like thinking about your hourly and what a project looks like in that frame, right? And then also thinking about it like if you did a project bid and knowing what different types and scales of projects, if you bid them with a like finite rate, what would that look like, right? And then also like, is it possible to have a retainer? Are you working with someone more regularly enough and you know that like, this is how much they're gonna need from mm -hmm. you and you wanna set a monthly rate that they pay you out, whether they need that or not, cause they're gonna keep coming back to you. So looking at those different frameworks of how to like set up pricing can be a good way to approach it as well. Okay, great. So one quick question, quick answers. As people are starting, should they do pro bono work? Jen. Um, I think this relates a little bit to one of the questions from the chat. Um, someone had posed a question about, you know, if you want to do, if you think you can do the work, but you haven't done it before, you know, how do you sell yourself and how do you get a project like that? And like, depends on how badly you want the project, depends on how badly you want that line of work, um, depends on if you have other means of income. Um, so you know, I started doing freelance work while I still had a day job. I was getting experience from the day job and I was also building up my skills as a freelancer. Um, if you are working for like a regular company, a lot of times, one of the things that I tell my team is that sometimes you have to do the work of your next role of your promoted role before you actually get the promotion. Oh, yeah. um, and that I think it might be true sometimes in freelance. And if you really want to do this particular kind of project or work, like, what are you willing to give up for that? Um, and, you know, is there a minimum you could charge? Like pro bono is hard. Like even, you know, the notion of unpaid internships, you know, was an old fashioned idea that, you know, I had to deal with, but, you know, luckily this generation doesn't have to deal with that as much, hopefully. Um, but if it's really important to you and there's a minimum you could charge or, you know, how are you, again, it goes back to what we were saying earlier about how are you adding value for the client? Um, at minimum, they're going to get X, Y, Z from you and it needs to cover this much of your time. Or is there a way to supplement your, your income in another way so that you can take on this free work? I have a couple friends who have who are starting up their own business and I'm lucky enough to have like a good day job. So I refuse to let them pay me because I don't want them to give me money because I know they're barely scraping things together themselves. They paid me in product. They do like candles and incense and like, you know, face, face stuff. And like, I'm just like, send me some of that stuff. And like, I get some examples from my portfolio and, you know, sometimes there's like a trade way of like reconciling it. So that way you're not giving things away for free. The other thing that, you know, I've seen done in the past and I've done, I think mostly successfully is sometimes I'll, you know, it's like when you, if you go to a restaurant pre-opening and if the restaurant is testing out their recipes and testing out their staff. And sometimes they have these friends and families and they don't charge you, but they still, sometimes they still give you a bill so that you can see how much this would have cost. Oh, um, yeah. I think that's a potential approach to like, this is what this work is worth. I'm going to give you this one gratis, but here's how I normally charge things. And like, I think this is worth it. And it kind of helps keep you accountable for the quality of the work that you're doing, even if it is free. Mm 